Morning, everybody. heart and mind in dwelling all we know or think or do or seek or find within our daily world in every human face love's echo sound and God is found within the common Morning, everybody. Glad to be singing with you all today. We're going to do a song uh, that Kezia introduced last week, um, which is one of those wonderful uh, songs that um, both 
asks us to uh, acknowledge God in our presence as we're singing to God or as we're um, asking God to make promises to us, but it also acknowledges other people's presence, um, uh, sort of like you're, you're living your life and you're doing your faith or you're doing whatever it is that, you know, is before you today in the presence of other people. So um, uh, we hope that this song uh, gets stuck in your head and uh, gives you a good message throughout your week. I want to sing two more songs with us in a moment, but first, um, I want to lead us all in a, a little bit of a guided prayer. So uh, if you can take a moment to um, find yourself in as quiet or as chill a space as you can while you're Zooming or Facebooking in right now, 
Um, we know that sometimes that's hard, uh, especially if you have children uh, or you just don't have the space entirely to yourself. But do whatever you can to take a moment to um, quiet your body. So the prayer we're going to do today is a prayer of kindness to ourselves. And um, the idea is that many who have written about contemplative or meditative prayer uh, in the Christian tradition uh, argue that being kind to ourselves is where we experience God's Holy Spirit. If we want to experience that part of God that lives among us right now that we can access at any time, where do we find that? We find that in being kind to ourselves. So that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, the image that I'm going to work uh, for us to help us do that is imagining that um, all of your thoughts and your feelings and your experiences of life are like a waterfall that comes down and falls on top of you. And usually we live life under that waterfall. What we're going to try to do for this time of prayer is to get behind the waterfall as if we're like in an alcove watching the waterfall come down and we're not underneath it we're not getting drenched by it but we're just observing what are the thoughts and the feelings and the experiences that are coming down and we're just watching it and we're taking it in and everything we see we don't judge it that's the key is we have to imagine Jesus is next to us in that waterfall and Jesus does not judge us as he sees the thoughts and the feelings and the stresses and the reactions to the stress that, that we all feel. He sees those things and he doesn't judge it. He says, oh, of course you feel that way. Of course you feel that way. Yes. And he always helps us to understand why we feel the way we feel. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to join Jesus in doing that rather than living under the waterfall and constantly lathering ourselves up into, uh, in, in, into, a, into a frenzy because we're so judgmental toward ourselves. We're being stepped back behind the waterfall, not letting it drench us. We're just observing what we see and thinking, oh, of course I feel that way, being kind to ourselves. And the idea is that I think we'll be able to feel, even, maybe even in our bodies, we'll be able to feel God's Holy Spirit. We feel like calm. We feel tension leave our shoulders. We feel a little tingling, little goosebumps. That's the idea of feeling God's Holy Spirit with us. So uh, join me. You can close your eyes if that helps you. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, God, we pull ourselves out from under the waterfall. We dry ourselves off a little bit and we stand in that alcove. And we're just watching all of those things come down that make up our story right now. And I just encourage you to quiet your mind, let this kind of like play out in your head and just watch and observe and notice the things that are tumbling down from the waterfall. I just want to enter a prayer into this space for anyone who is finding themselves not even realizing that they were judging all of their reactions, judging all of their thoughts and feelings. Oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Oh, that thought is, you can't bring that to church space. Come on, you can't bring that into God's company. Anyone who is doing any judging of their thoughts and their feelings of their reactions, anyone who's feeling any shame as they do this, I just now invite you, Jesus, to kind of give us your Holy Spirit right now that we can be kind to ourselves, that we can see every one of these things and just think, of course, that's how I feel. Of course, that's, how my, that's my reaction to that situation. Of course, this is what I'm thinking. And I also want to enter a little prayer into your spaces, into your mind spaces as you guys are playing this out in front of you. 
Also a prayer for anyone who is judging themselves because they're getting distracted. Oh, other people are so much better at this than me. Oh, I'm supposed to be focusing on, you know, and just observing, but I keep on, oh, the, my phone just went off. I checked the notification. I'm so rotten at prayer. And so we just, once again, God, give us your Holy Spirit. Jesus, you're right next to us here in this alcove. And you are not judging us. You are not judging us even now. You are being kind to us. And, and, and if we can be kind to ourselves, we will feel you as well. That's where we will hear your voice. That's where we will understand where what, what we truly should feel challenged about and not just what voices from our entire lives, our parents' voices, our, our self-critical voices are telling us what to do. You will speak to us in a different way. So we just ask you would lend us some of your kindness now that we could be kind to ourselves. And we're going to be quiet together for just one more minute. of the Lord is the kindness of the Lord with every breath we take gift of life and grace power of the Lord is the meekness of the Lord who bore humanity with brave humility let your mercy flow through your mercy, your mercy, let your mercy flow through us. Your mercy, your mercy.
sit in the seat of honor at the table none are best
everyone. Um, this is Rebecca. I am a stakeholder at the BLC and I'm going to lead us in some prayer today. Um, big thing on my mind this morning is the fact that it is actually National Coming Out Day and I am a queer person of faith and so um, uh, this day has always been a special one for me just thinking about my own journey and a lot of other things and um, the biggest thing about being queer and coming out um, was feeling accepted, feeling like, like really, first of all, by myself, just <laughs> like this huge overwhelming wave of like, oh, there's a name for this thing that I've been feeling and there's, it's fine that it's this way and it's good, um, that it's, it's not just normal, but like great. <laughs> it makes me who I am more than I knew. Um, and just, I, I think that's what I want to pray for today. I just want to pray this feeling that I remember of having, of being loved just recklessly, just feeling like, hey, there's a place for you. You belong. There's a, there's something real that's always been there waiting for you. Um, and just God sort of taking me by the hand and saying like I wasn't gonna love you anyway like I wasn't gonna like this changes anything like you don't belong absolutely not absolutely not you are mine and I knew this the whole time and I love you more because now you know it too um so I just I want to pray that everybody feels just recklessly loved by God today just absolutely like Jesus is never going to tell you no. Um, yeah, I just hope that you feel his presence with you today. And I hope that you have a great day and that we have a really good service. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you for sharing so openly. We appreciate that. We appreciate you bringing your story to be among all the stories that make up this church uh, well, hi, everybody. Again, uh, I am Vince. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, for some of us, it's been a week of personal triumphs. For others, it's been a week of family loss. For some of us, it's been a week of birthday celebrations. For others, it's been a week of hard conversations. And so whatever thoughts or feelings you are bringing in today, we want you to know you are so welcome here. And we hope that you feel uh, pulled out of yourself um, connected with God uh, by the music, by the prayer. We hope uh, that our discussion helps to do that for you today as well. Uh, Brownline Church is both a local to Chicago and a beyond Chicago community. Uh, we started this church in particular to be a space uh, to grow spiritually for people who uh, feel more comfortable in progressive or secular settings rather than classically religious settings. So we want you to know that whatever religious or non-religious tradition you come from, uh, you are so welcome here. And we think that you'll uh, feel talked to here. You don't have to drink some religious Kool-Aid before you can understand. Uh, we are an extremely diverse uh, community in terms of religious background. Like most people, we're after a deep full life and our guide here is Jesus. Uh, there are religious settings that present Jesus uh, and faith in Jesus as like an exclusive thing, as oppositional, uh, even as like aligned with uh, American white conservatism and that culture. But that has just never been our experience for us following Jesus and spiritual growth that's grounded in the biblical tradition has always made us uh, more inclusive, more humble, more compassionate, and more sensitive to the sufferings of others, especially the marginalized, especially those who are not in power, like the white guys like me. <laughs> so uh, some quick shout outs uh, before we get going with our service today. Uh, a shout out, of course, to Rebecca Jan for praying for us. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, to Lara Johnson, who's running our visuals, making sure that we can follow along with the music and with the discussion today. Thank you, Lara. You're awesome. And then to Allison May, who will be our moderator for today. She's going to make sure that we have all the information that we need as we go forward. Uh, she's going to keep our live chat going during our discussion here. 
Uh, Allison, if I can just invite you in for a second, do you have any uh, prompt for us today to kind of get us going with the chat? It can be ridiculous. It can also be heartfelt. I, I also like things that are a little bit of both, uh, but whatever. Uh, do you have anything for us today, Allison? Yeah, I do. Um, and it leans towards ridiculous. So. Yes, I'm for <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> okay. This is um, one of my favorite starters to my class, like one of my favorite questions to ask my students. It's a would you rather? And it's would you rather have fingers that are the size of your toes or toes that are the size of your fingers? Fantastic. I am so thankful that you asked this question. It's been burning on my heart to uh, to reply. Yeah. I, have, I have to think about that for a second for me. Yeah, I'm sure um, many people have been wanting a chance to discuss this. It's, it's really important. You've given us this space. Thank you to Brownland Church for giving <laughs> much needed space for the conversations that America is having. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Very important. <laughs> Allison, you're great. Thank you so much. So Allison will be watching our chat as we look forward and we would love for you to participate today as we go forward. Well, uh, according to Pew Research, everybody, eight in 10 white evangelicals in the US say that they will vote for Donald Trump next month. In uh, 2016, a majority of both Protestants and Catholics in the US voted for Donald Trump. These are the realities that we are engaging in our new series uh, of Sunday discussions that we started last week. Who is Jesus? when most American Christians back Trump. So let me introduce uh, Kyle Hanawalt, my co-pastor. Once again, Kyle, what are we doing with this series and why are we doing it? Yeah, thank you, Vince. Um, and my initial reaction was absolutely finger toes. But then I thought about living in cold weather here in Chicago and you wouldn't be able to get boots. You'd have to have custom made boots. And at the at heart of who I am, I'm a cheap person. And I think it would cost more money to have finger toes than it would to have toe fingers. But, um, uh, but back to this series, the reason we're doing this series <laughs> is at its heart, because there is a narrative that is taken as a given amongst far too much of our country about where, where faith in Jesus is positioned culturally. You know, I think about my good friend after the 2016 election who uh, has since uh, about a decade ago left uh, an experience of faith and talked about what for them felt like the dichotomy of this moment, which is the pieces of their faith that felt most rich and important were the ones that encouraged them to care about the least of us, to advocate for the poor, to see uh, a sense of welcome to the outsider, but where they experienced faith in church in their settings, um, where the narrative and conversation around faith was looking at an election that was largely won on the back of Christian voters, saw where Jesus they experienced positioned in our culture felt very far away from a life of mission and value that aligned with what they wanted. And so for us, we're doing a series here where we're taking a step back and saying, who is Jesus? Looking at the life, the teaching, the parts of Jesus to say, if we are a Jesus centered church and trying to follow him, what does that mean for us? And it's important for us to engage in this for two different reasons. One is to reclaim a narrative, the idea that it is just a given that Jesus and the, the faith centered on Jesus is existing in white uh, American conservatism is something that it's important that we are pushing back against. Important because I think there are many like me in an earlier part of my life who do want to pursue Jesus but feel exhausted or feel like there isn't space to do that without having to swallow the bitter pill of a cultural uh, approach to life that feels not aligned with how they want to approach life. Um, secondly, it's important that we do this, that we approach this because Lord, we need Jesus right now. Uh, we need Jesus right now. I need Jesus every time I read the news. I need Jesus every time Trump opens his mouth. I need Jesus as I'm wrestling with the world right now. And if we are not speaking about who Jesus is in terms of how he resources us today, how he encourages us today, how he meets us as a living God today to offer us hope when we feel despair, to offer us guidance when we feel lost, to offer us healing where we felt trauma, 
I think that in this season, we will find that we are missing something. This is a season right now that is provoking and, and igniting uh, feelings of previous trauma for so many. This is a moment here where people are being brought into emotions of anger and hurt and lost and trust. And it is not just a narrative argument, it is the resource of a living God right now. And if we are actually going to help be part of our country being a reflection of what we think Jesus would be in this world. And not just because we think it, but looking at the life, the teachings of Jesus, of who Jesus was. What does that mean for how we walk into this next month? And so we're doing a series right now where we are doing that very thing. We are asking ourselves in light of the social narrative of where Jesus exists in our culture today, if we actually look at Jesus's life, who is he? And then who are we as people who try to follow him? And so uh, I'm excited, I'll pass it back to Vince who will introduce our, our very, our, our conversation specifically for today and our, our wonderful guest who's gonna be having uh, help us drive this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. And um, if you're curious about the first in our series last week uh, with our friend Haley Larson, um, one of the uh, seminary students, theologians, worship leaders in our church, um, you can definitely check that out on our YouTube channel. Uh, but today, uh, we are going to be guided, as Kyle mentioned, by a special guest, uh, an old friend of our church, Joey Rodill. Hi, Joey. Hello. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, so Joey was a part of our church for a number of years until he moved to attend seminary. This was uh, uh, maybe like five years ago, probably at this point, uh, but he has remained a friend and stayed connected with our church. Last year, Joey joined uh, Brownline Church's financial board as one of our two outside perspective members of that board. Uh, and as a seminary student and as an advocate for LGBTQ inclusion in churches, we are super grateful to have him today as a creative theologian, as a practitioner of Jesus informed justice. So as Joey guides us, um, as we get going, I want to remind you again, Allison, our moderator will be watching our live chat today. So please uh, engage as we go along, ask your questions, offer your comments, uh, tell us what, what this brings up for you. And uh, we'll rope those in before we're done here um, in our discussion. But Joey, uh, if I can jump right in um, to, uh, you've prepared a few, uh, I, a few points for us that we'll put up on the screen here for uh, in a second. And um, so the first thing I wanted to I wanted to throw to you is your first point, which is that uh, Jesus's mission asks us which side of history we want to be on. So take it away, Joey. Tell us more about this. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, especially in this climate uh, and why we are having this particular conversation, uh, it is historical. Um, what we do now is going to be something that is going to be set on our individual narratives and our historical timeline um, for us, uh, for each of us. And so I think one of the first things we have to ask ourselves is like, what are we supposed to be doing? Um, and we find that in the text, um, uh, you have it here, Matthew 25, 36, or 31 to 46, um, whatever you do for one of the least of these you do for me. And when you go into that text, it's about feeding the hungry, clothing the, the naked, right? And uh, you can dive deeply, more deep into that. Um, but because you're doing it to the least of these, you're doing it to Jesus. This is what this text is saying. Um, and so we find ourselves asking the question, what are we supposed to be doing? And I think this text says exactly that. Um, and if we bring it all together, it's like we're supposed to be taking care of one another and who we are and where we are. Um, and so these are tangible expressions of the mission of Jesus. Like you can actually see these actions. You, you can do these things. And so where in history are you going to fall on that? Are you going to fall on the historical timeline of doing something or, or like doing something that is going to be detrimental or like even harmful. Thank you, yeah, Joey. the uh, Joey, the 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 text um, that uh, you're bringing us to of this, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me, um, is wrapped up in a in a, a really like one of the more scary like cosmic stories that Jesus tells about like at the end of the age we will separate the sheep who are righteous and from the goats who are unrighteous. 
and then and then this is the thing that that separates them and you know that way of talking and that way of like cosmic imagery was actually really common in his day so it makes sense that he would use very like end of time language and we don't really use language like that but i think we do use this language that you're talking about here about like being on the right side of history like we do we do think about placing ourselves in a context right like what are we what's going to be our legacy when we look back are we going to be people who can feel proud of what we did. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at with this idea. And to me, that's yeah, like, we, we are, we're longing for, I think you're so right to say like, we're longing, like, what, what, do, we, what do we do? What is before me? What is, what, is the, what is the right course of action? What is the wise thing to do? And it, and it is, it's these simple acts. What are you doing for the least of society? No, it's it's interesting where we are right now in this conversation of you have the, the a majority a very vocal majority that is saying this is where Jesus stands in our culture and they're claiming it amongst a, the a, some a right wing political ideology um, and you think about throughout history uh, it has been the predominant religious experience to be late on social progression. It is the uh, fighting against uh, slavery, fighting against racism, fighting against oppression and giving rights to women, um, fighting against the inclusion of LGBTQ. It is, it's always been the religious majority that has been at times decades late on this conversation. But at the same time, in many of these pieces, it was a religious, Jesus-centered minority that was fighting for the other side. It was it was abolitionists fighting against slavery. It was civil rights movements fighting against the inclusion and breaking down of the systemic racism that we saw in our country. It was it was um, suffragettes that were fighting for the women's right to vote. And in many places, it was uh, Christian LGBTQ individuals that were trying to create greater space uh, for the inclusion of all of us. And I think what's interesting where we are in this place right now, we're kind of saying the same thing right now. It is not a new thing for the majority of those who claim a name for Jesus to be holding on to something that is actually, uh, I think in many ways, falling on the wrong side of history. But at the same time, I think there's a, a pursuit of Jesus, a, a real sense of what are you doing here, Jesus? And he's gonna, he tells us, what are we doing here? It is fighting for the least of these that we do something. And we have actually seen that throughout history that has actually helped us bring us into a place of justice and bring us into a place of, of progression as a society. Joey, do you think that like, the, I, I think that Kyle's really right to cast this as like a, a minority groups within Jesus movements that seem to like be at the heart of what Jesus is, was talking about and what he modeled himself, but then majority kind of lagging behind and having to be dragged forward. Do you have hope or a sense that like, um, that something like that can happen in this time, that there can be like our, our goal here with this, with this series of like shifting the narrative. Like there, you know, when people think of Jesus, they actually think of caring for the least of these and not the, you know, conservative politics in America. Do you have hope? Oh, absolutely. I don't know if I really? could. Yeah, I, I, if I couldn't, I don't know if I could really follow the essence of Jesus if I didn't have hope. Um, okay. I think that is one of the, that's one of the driving forces of social change and justice is that you have to continuously find hope in these times in people who are doing the work and in yourself to do the work. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I could continue, continue to um, seek the essence of Jesus or feel the essence of Jesus if I didn't have hope that it's going to be better um, and we can make it better. Um, but again, we have to do those things to um, make it better. Yeah, and, just, and the hope will arise from those. Oh, sorry, sorry, please continue. No, I, I was just, um, just following, I don't follow media as much as I used to just because I don't like to have, well, it's just a lot of stress and anxiety for me right now. So um, what I do follow are people who are doing this work continuously in the city of Chicago alone um, and just around the country of different religious leaders or they're even there and this is hard to say sometimes but there are politicians who we need to support that are yeah. on the side of hope that they can make a change. 
That is such a great distinction, Joey, of just saying the difference between following media and following people who are doing the work. And maybe that is what we need to increase our diet of in order to find more hope. Uh, that keeps us informed. It keeps us at the, you know, like uh, understanding like what is going on in my world. It doesn't mean burying your head in the sand to not follow media. What it does mean is choosing to follow hope instead, choosing to follow people who are doing the work. That's really good. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's see uh, what uh, the second, I, I, I almost see your second point actually like peeking in as we were talking about that. So I want to hear more about how Jesus's mission, the way he described it, the way he models it, uh, asks us if we are going to defend the powerful or the non-powerful. And you, in, in talking this week, brought us to the parable of uh, Jesus leaving the 99 for the one. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Because I thought your work with that was really, really interesting. Right, right. So this is actually one of my favorite um, stories or parables. Uh, and it is talking about the one sheep who is off to the side, or as the text would say, went astray, right? And then the 99 are on the other side going, doing their what they're supposed to be doing or on their, the one side. And the shepherd is going to go after the one. Uh, and so I like to play around with text. <laughs> and sometimes people are like, ooh, that might be a little sacrilegious or whatever, but, uh, um, or heretical, um, but I'm not a heretic, I promise. People call me out on it if I would be. Uh, but I like to say like using the Joey Revised Standard Version that um, <laughs> the one sheep was not really a stray. Uh, I believe that we can interpret this or even use it as the one sheep was set to the side and marginalized. You have 99 on one side and you have one on the other side. Um, socially, that's a little strange, you know, unless you've been pushed over, right? You've been pushed over, like cut out of that 100 group as if I did the math correctly, right? Um, and so, I like to say that the one sheep that Jesus or the shepherd is going after is the one that has been pushed to the side, that's been marginalized, that people have been not looking really and just following what this society tells us to or these systems that are working for the powerful, right? So the 99 will continue to move that way. And then the one is going the other way, but nobody's looking back except the shepherd, right? And so... I feel that in this story, we can say that Jesus or the shepherd is going after the one that doesn't have power mm. and wants to like bring that sheep, not actually, I don't know if he wants to bring the sheep, but I think he wants to take the 99 and push them over to the one. And that would be change. You get 99 moved over to the one sheep on the other side. And I think that is what social change can look like. We can't stay on the side of the 99 where all this power is being held, but if we shift it over to where there is no power, then I think that's where we can say that Jesus is advocating for a social change and not a lot of power. I just love that idea of reading the, the scripture as about power and not about like a number majority. What does it mean that there are 99 over here and one over here? It's not about like, oh, you know, like here's here, here's all the people and you're and you're the outlier. Like you said, like that's actually socially kind of strange. When does that happen? You know, it's like as Kyle was describing before, the majority are the ones that go with the status quo, you know, that uh, that don't live courageously. But this idea of it being about power and about these 99 have, have power structures in place to protect them. The one does not. And that's who Jesus goes after. That's who Jesus defends. Uh, Kyle, you were going to say something. Yeah, I just say, I mean, that totally jives. Like I had not, you know, I, I, I don't own the copy of the Joey Revised Standard Edition yet. Um, but let me know when it's released. Uh, but uh, that totally jives with me. This idea of where is Jesus's attention on the, the one that is vulnerable, the one that is at risk. Um, and what are the ones, what are the 99? They're the ones that are safe. They are okay. They literally have the structures of the sheep pen around them or the status quo is 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 there that is keeping them in a place of, of, of safety and a, a place 
place of things going well for them, opposed to the sheep that is out and lost and vulnerable. And where does Jesus draw his attention? It is on the, the one that is at risk, the one that is vulnerable and is going to leave behind those that are kept up by the structures of the world that they live in to draw their attention on the one that is at risk. And I think we can see that in our society too. And, and even more complicated when the structures of our religious systems uphold people and what does it mean for us to think about those who are at risk those who are vulnerable and think about power in terms of, of the way that the structures around us are elevating people and then those who are at risk because the structures are not there for them and where does jesus pursue jesus pursues the one outside of the structures of power and i think that that totally totally jives with me in terms of where I see Jesus show up in my life, show up in my world. It is it is not when I'm leaning into comfort. It is not when I'm leaning into and looking at those who are powerful and things are going well for them. It is when I am spending my time and energy pursuing and seeing those who have risk. And even within myself, where is growth happening within me? It is when I am leaning into the places in my own heart that I am at risk, leaning into the places in my own heart that are broken and need help. It's not when I'm leaning into the privilege of being a white man and society is treating me well. I think that that is a, it's incredibly important for us to think about where does Jesus position himself in today's culture? Right. And a side note on the Joey Revised Standard Version. Um, everybody has their own standard revised version. Um, as long as you are just putting yourself in the text and reading the text, Revelation, oh, you're going to have your own standard revised version. And it's amazing how that's going to lead your life. Um, but one thing I did want to add was another, this is a question to pose. You don't have to answer it, but it's more like rhetorical and for everybody to think about is that what if one of the 99 decided that uh, they wanted to go with the shepherd to go help the one? And I, I really want to know what the, the rest of the 98 would feel if that one went with the shepherd and said, whoa, 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 there's one on the other side, one following the shepherd, and now there's another so like what are we doing you're going to turn some heads i think if you saw the shepherd and one of the 99 came and made 28 on the other side i think that is a, something to think about i love that joey how would you encourage us if we want to be that uh that 99th sheep that leaves the 98 oh gosh that is so hard there's so much you could do i think one thing is vote you could vote uh, mm. and be on the one sheep um, that is just voting and making your voice heard. Um, and then just getting involved, um, I think is one of the main things. Um, is just getting involved and just being aware. But I think we'll go into that later, I think so. But... Definitely, definitely. I Go ahead, Kyle. Well, I was gonna say, I like to imagine the 98th sheep in the one. So this is this is in the, the, the context of Jesus's ministry, where he himself is saying this. And then you have at the end of his time in the ministry, he gives the Great Commission, which then tells all of his disciples, now you go out and do this work. And so I, I like to imagine this idea that the 90, the 99th sheep or the 98th sheep are the ones that, um, that like the world we live in right now, post this commission to go and do the work and do as Jesus did, is an invitation for us in in some ways to see our our role in stepping out of that pen to go and help the vulnerable help the sheep that is at risk um because at this point now um jesus has invited us into his mission i think that it's the way that i like to think about that i love that guys that's, yeah, that's so good. good so good that's good i i you know i think it, it feels worth it here to address one of the questions that we kind of set out thinking this is an important question to answer uh, through the course of this series, just for our church. And one of it, it one of the questions that uh, I think is important is, uh, are we just, um, so, we, you know, we're, we're sort of putting a very clear stake in the ground in terms of this series, who is Jesus when most American Christians back Trump? It's not, uh, it's not subtle. It's not, um, uh, it, it's, it's not unclear where it is we stand uh, in terms of uh, this coming election. 
And, uh, and so one question that you might ask is, are we over politicizing to the left? Are we doing sort of the same thing that we feel so upset by the religious right having done for decades now? And so we're hypocrites because we're over politicizing just to the opposite direction. And I think that that's a really important question to address. And also I wanna say that I don't think that that is the case. I do think that, uh, here, here's why I don't think, I think it's because of what Joey is talking about here with power dynamics, that when, uh, when we are as political as necessary to follow Jesus's values, and if that gets labeled as partisan, if it gets labeled as partisan to be that sheep that goes with the shepherd to, 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 to defend the one and bring the one back, then, then it gets labeled as partisan and there's nothing we can do about it, right? But I don't think actually that we are over political or partisan, uh, I mean, in, in terms of those of us who are locally in Chicago, we all know that nearly every elected, elected official in Chicago is democratic. And we're not letting up on them for the lack of criminal justice reform and the lack of education reform and funding for education, the lack of uh, access to affordable health care, and the way some communities are completely forgotten in terms of resource sharing and others get all of it. And so, you know, like the, I think in this case, this is what uh, th this is an important way to understand like when we talk about you know being really clear and explicit in terms of a political uh, out uh, outset in America I don't think that that means that you're automatically you know uh, 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 overly politicizing uh, the gospel I think that Jesus what he encouraged us to be is hey these are these are the values to pursue if you end up being labeled as political as a result of that so be it Well, Joey, we have uh, one more idea that you wanted to take us to. So uh, tell us more about how uh, Jesus' mission asks us to embrace constant movement. Oh, constant movement. Yes. So um, so it asks us to embrace constant movement. I think if we follow the life of Jesus uh, through the Gospels, you're going to find him on consistent movement. Um, he's consistently moving from place to place, from people group to people group, um, doing what he does, right? Um, and that is helping others, finding the way to the light, right? To finding the way of what, how we can be better humans for one another. Uh, and so I think in this story here, um, where the Jesus was on the way to a Jewish synagogue to help out a leader with his daughter, uh, if I get that correct, um, he's stopped by a woman who like brushes against his, you know, his garb that he's wearing, his attire, and he feels that, and he, no, like feels like this woman needs help, so he stops what he's doing in this constant movement to help this woman along the way, um, and so as we're moving towards our goal of helping like humanity and such, uh, I think we have to know that these aren't disruptions. These are opportunities uh, to help each other in these times. Um, and so, especially in like this social and political climate um, we find ourselves in, um, there's much work to do. And just as this, there are people that are hurting, there's people that need help. And so, I know we have goals of what we're going to do this season and fight this season, but at the same time, we there's still consistent movement in taking pivoting and helping those who are hurting in the community um, as we go towards helping or our goal of helping others. I, I'm so struck by that, Joey, as I think about. The, the thing we've talked about just now about this idea of often the religious majority throughout history being uh, so delayed in movement. And often what I've experienced, so, you know, my, my context was this experience of like, through my whole childhood, there was a big wrestling of like, do we think women can really lead? Like, is that a thing we're okay with? And then that was something that was like wrestled through. And at least in the context of where I was, it was like, okay, yes. We've, we've, hit a, we've hit a majority of minds changed that we can all say aloud, yes, we can be led by women. Um, and then it was, you know, like there, and what I experienced, especially amongst um, 
uh, people of a generation older than mine is that when we hit the question of inclusion of LGBTQ, there was kind of like a, like we just like we got to the arrived place now women are included and there was almost a sense of like a resistance to pivot to like the next sense of like what is the next thing for us to to be engaging in um, and i think that what we see in jesus is a constant awareness within his own local context that this is never and when we're talking about his the the power of jesus's freedom the power of jesus meeting need it is not a finite thing it is a seeing what's going on and then pivoting to the next thing to make sure that we're constant in action, which is why we as a church so love the idea of centered set, a constant movement towards Jesus opposed to bounded set, which is figuring out how do we get in, and then once we're in, we're in. This is a never-ending journey of self-understanding, a never-ending journey of fighting for justice and helping seeing the kingdom of God revealed here on earth. And I, I just think that that's incredibly important to Joey, so I appreciate you bringing us to that. Yeah, I think... Um... And I like how you said that we need to be aware of what's going on. As much as I hate the media, I am still making myself aware of what's going on politically, um, religiously, and socially around the country. And in celebration of National Coming Out Day, and thank you, Rebecca, for that prayer and bringing that up, um, I too am and will never be ashamed of saying that I am queer. And I have um, this theologian, she's also queer, Marcia, or Marcella Althus Reed, um, and she did a lot of work in liberation theology, a feminist and queer theology as well. But she said, we need to read the life, uh, or sorry, we need to read the life of Jesus with the same eyes that we read stories and tabloids about, and she specifically says homosexuals, or homosexual people being killed. And I would like to take like what she said, yeah, we need to like look at these tabloids and read them in the eyes of Jesus, like, and Jesus's life. Um, and I like to take like homosexual that she used here and put that in like with people who are harm, being harmed right now, black bodies, right? Trans bodies, all like undocumented immigrants. Like, are we taking the, are we taking these tabloids or these news and media stories of what's happening around the world and are we reading them with the lens of the life of Jesus in that and I just love how she says that and so that like I think that encourages us to be aware of what's going on around our country around our city around the world so we can be ready or and be in constant movement to do what's next to help. Well and you talk about a way to um, see uh, the scriptures the gospels uh, come alive to you is, I mean, you think about just how emotionally activated any of us are almost immediately when we're reading the news. Um, and, you know, and that, and that's because we get all of the references and we're in the, we're in this context where we, we can't escape it in the age of the internet. Right. And, um, and if we, if we can read the scriptures and just kind of, um, you know, kind of ha have that sort of same, like, oh, you know, if we were, if we were there, if we knew all those references and we got the context and we were immersed in it, we would have these same emotional feelings about the, the provocative and loving and radically inclusive nature of Jesus. And uh, I mean, so, I mean, honestly, what you're describing, it kind of can go both ways, right? Like it can activate us in today. It can also get us back to, you know, if you're saying like, we got to go to the stories that feed hope, you know, we got to go to the stories of people doing the work. I mean, Jesus can be, the gospels can be an example of something that feeds hope by seeing somebody doing the work. Uh, if we can, if we can read them from that perspective. Awesome. Yeah, it, it seems like there, I would love to in, also invite Allison in now too, if you want to share with us anything that's been going on in the chats and stuff, I've, I see a, a bunch of things happening there. Anything that stands out to you uh, to kind of loop into the conversation? Yeah, um, the chat is hopping. So um, one of the things that was said um, much earlier in the conversation is something that Rebecca shared. So Rebecca, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to put this out there. Okay. Um, she wrote something um, about a year ago, I think she said, I am reminded that if Jesus could be on earth with us today, we would invite him to speak and instead he would listen. And, um, and, I, and she shared that at the beginning and I just kept thinking about it the more that um, Joey shared. 
And so I thought that was really poignant. I wanted to share that with everybody. Um, and then somebody else also said in response to that, that many people in power today probably wouldn't even recognize him if he was here um, on earth. And um, I also wanna just point out that a lot of people resonated, Joey, with what you said about hope. Um, and I felt that very encouraging as well, because I mean, speaking for myself, it's been really hard to keep up hope. Um, and for you to just talk about how you find hope and how you keep that alive is really helpful. And many people were posting that they resonate with that. Um, there was another question um, that I wanna pose to you, Joey. There's two questions that I wanna pose to you. And one is somebody said, what happens when conservative family members think you are the one sheep who needs to be saved? So because you're too liberal, you're too out there, you're the one who needs to be saved. How, what do you do? Oh, that's hard. And the only thing that can come to mind how I can answer that is um, historically and through this, the text, the scripture, uh, I would say wasn't Jesus the one sheep um, set aside back then? Um, in the minority um, with uh, his small group of followers. So that's what I would say is uh, maybe look at it from that lens that Jesus is not the shepherd in that story. Um, and perhaps he was in that time the actual sheep that was marginalized. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I really like that. That's a great way to frame that. And I think that those conservative family members who like to think that they know everything about the Bible could see that, could recognize that. Um, I think that's great. Uh, so thank you. And there's another question too. Um, when you talked about how everyone has their own revised standard version of the Bible, um, somebody um, said something that I, I identified with too, where they were, they said there's a struggle with that, with interpreting scripture in a personal way because some people like to twist scripture and we don't we want to be cautious and we don't want to fall into that um do you have any any guidance for that of how we could trust ourselves um how or yeah as we're interpreting scripture personally oh absolutely so i said that in the sense that you will do your own studying um you will get your you'll go and dive into resources that perhaps um, people in Brown Line can share with you or your community that can read into like different interpretations of the Bible that are not harmful. Yes, we're going to have different interpretations that are harmful out there um, and even harmful to the sense that they can lead to death. And that's what we don't want. Um, so yeah, definitely dive into when you're doing your interpretations um, I think there's something so special about revelation, but it, when you're reading scripture, um, but dive into that, even though you think you understand, see what other theologians are saying, see what other pastors or um, religious leaders that you trust and that you follow, see what they're saying about that. Um, I wouldn't go on it by yourself. Uh, that's where it can be harmful too is when you start to think oh i this is the way i'm interpreting it like the whole when i interpreted the whole shepherd thing i'm not going to take 100 percent credit for that that is some that has come up in different con conversations that i've been in um and so yeah it's definitely don't do it on your own when you're interpreting yes it is going to be a struggle but that i think that's the beauty of discernment and revelation when you're trying to figure that out. I just gotta say, Joey, I just so deeply appreciate the, the sharing of that. As somebody who grew up with evangelical roots, um, like this is, you know, the idea of, of I'm interpreting it personally and there's not just this objective, like clear thing is hard for me to wrestle with because that's a framework I came in of like, hey, this is what this means. Um, but the thing I so appreciate about what you said is, hey, this is how my read on this. And so therefore, if your read on that was harmful, if your read on that was 
uh, working against the peace of my own heart and the action of justice in the world around me. Um, there's the humility to own that you that is your read. And it's not just out of nowhere. It's informed by the theology that you study. It's informed by your practice. It's informed by your experience. But the truth is, even the most conservative preacher that goes up there and says, this is how you read this passage, that is their personal interpretation. The damage in it is when they say, this is the interpretation and it is clear. And it's damaging not only because they are no longer speaking for themselves, they're speaking for God, but it also displays a lack of self-awareness and humility that they are wrestling with the scripture. Because they once you, once you believe you've gotten it, I generally believe that you're missing it. There needs to be a constant wrestling. And so I think even though that that is a, a growing experience for me, it is actually, I think, really helpful for us to think about when we approach scripture that we should always be owning how we read it. It should always be through our own lens because none of us here are skilled enough to pull off the layers of our culture, pull off the layers of our personality, and all of us are human enough to want to believe that we get it right. Um, that's just our in, inner being. And the, the more privilege you have, the whiter and more male you are, the more you might actually believe the reality that you have it right. And it's because society in so many ways is set up to say, oh, you probably do have it right. Look how well your life goes for you. And I think that's a particular extra ask on those of us who come from a white male religious upbringing, the recognition that we are always doing our personal understanding with the context we have. And we have to own it or else we're gonna not only damage and stunt ourselves, but likely damage other people. Well, this is all so good. And, and just to, uh, to encourage um, everyone who's just engaging and, and particularly who resonates with that question, the second question, Allison, that you brought up is I think one way we can feel, um, feel uh, comforted in, uh, in the efforts, uh, in our own efforts, is that uh, if you are engaging in community, like like a church like this, you're already doing a major, major, um, uh, like key uh, part of uh, protecting yourself against harmful interpretations of scripture, which is you're just doing it with other people. And so, you know, that's a lot of uh, I think what we're what we're trying to do uh, here in Sundays, as we as we've been doing discussions. Um, and yeah, and I just think that that is that this is to me that this is exactly what we uh, what we need to be doing uh, in order to avoid harmful interpretations of scripture. Well, at least for the sake of time, I think we have to start to wind down to a close here. Uh, Joey, I would love for you to, to give you one last chance just to make like any any final comment. And then if you would pray for us, that would be awesome. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think the final things that I would like to say are like in questions like, um, what what's your story what's our story um what's your narrative and where is this going to fall in to your historical timeline to your life um and i think that's something we should think about all the time um and like what will our stories tell um of us like they tell of jesus's life right he shares all these stories so what are your stories going to tell about your life um and it's going to it's going to look different for each of us. How we contribute is going to be different. So I don't, one thing I want to encourage everyone to do is not to measure yourself against anyone else in this work of social change, um, or even in just like following the life of Jesus, never measure your life to somebody else's life and what they're doing. Um, and it's kind of hard because we have Instagram, we have Facebook, Twitter, all these things that will show you what all these other people are doing. And then you can feel like embarrassed or shame. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. You can't measure yourself against them. Sometimes to me, sometimes that can be a little bit performative um, when you do that and you just don't, that's not you. And this is how they're doing their work. You do it your own way. Um, and so to take care of yourself in that and self-care, um, the work that we do in just sharing the life of Jesus and the love of Jesus um, it can get hard and overwhelming. And sometimes we get a little bit beaten down. We cannot forget that you need to take care of yourself. Um, don't forget that Jesus told, I think it was in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus told his disciples, oh, okay, um, like take a minute, go to a deserted place, come away to a deserted place, I think it says, um, and stay a while by yourself. 
like I mean it's instructions like people like oh you just got to keep moving no you don't (laughs) you got to make sure that you're healthy emotionally you're getting the help you need like emotionally physically mentally um, in order to continue this work of sharing like the life of Jesus and what we should be doing to like help each other Um, and then lean on your community like we all have different communities so make sure you do that too um, when you and um, I think that is all that I have left to share Um, and hopefully I have not led anybody astray Um, but uh, I guess I go into prayer right Uh, okay good sorry I haven't been (laughs) in a church service in a while Um, so let's go ahead and pray oh uh, God of multiplicity a divine being of justice we ask you to just continue to be with us uh, in this time. Um, Help us and nurture us. Give us the health uh, that we need to continue to share with others what it is to truly be an example of human love. Um, We thank you for your continued love and your provision. Lead us into ways of mercy and kindness. And I also ask for a special blessing over Brownline Church and the community um, as you lead them into righteousness and you give them the strength to continue to share the identity of your divinity and your multifaceted being. Um, I pray that your spirit will protect us through this week and that your wisdom and revelation will help us um, bring light to the world uh, so that they can see lightness in their places of darkness. Um, And since today is National Coming Out Day, I do give a special prayer for all those who are out there struggling um, to come out due to safety or other factors that may be harmful to them, that you would continue to comfort them or even if this is the first time, reveal yourself to them, um, that they may be comforted and know that they are not alone. Amen. Amen. Joey, we are so grateful. Thank you so much for spending Sunday with us. This was awesome. Um, I think I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot of follow-up. So, uh, if you, if you want to, you know, like ask a question or something like, uh, you know, follow up with something that Joey said, uh, we'll make sure you, you can pass it on to us and we'll make sure that Joey gets that. We are so appreciative, Joey. Um, I did want to make just in that space and especially with what you were leaving us with Joey, one little quick pastoral comment. And I think we'll mention this again before our series is over. Uh, it would be good for us to prepare our hearts uh, that it is somewhat likely um, the week of the election. So that's that's uh, November 3rd is the election. So uh, it is it is somewhat likely that no official winner will be declared because of all of the mail-in voting that's going on. Um, and I want us to prepare our hearts for the possibility that if that's the case uh, and the in-person uh, voting um, is is, is uh, weighted toward uh, Donald Trump, it is likely that he will probably declare victory. And whether or not that's like grounded in, in evidence at that time, I think it, it's, it's important for us to recognize that many in our community may feel really like brought into trauma or crisis by such a thing happening. And we want to, I think all of us prepare, we are only three weeks away. Uh, and, and I think we want to be ready to commit now that we as a community are here to take care of each other and here to protect each other and here to make sure that any who are the one sheep that are marginalized, we are going after them and we are protecting them. And so just in terms of what Joey was saying about like committing to uh, your community, whether, whether we're talking, as I mentioned this, hopefully you're thinking about people within this church and you're thinking about this church itself, but you also may be thinking about other friends or family uh, that uh, people who may feel uh, traumatized or in crisis uh, if that happens. And I just want us to be, I, I want our church to be a place that actually acknowledges this, talks about this, sees this out on the horizon and says, hey, this is, a, this is an opportunity for a spiritual community to protect and care for each other uh, right now. And so we want that, we want everybody to be thinking about that. And and we will will sort of 
keep mentioning this because it's important for us as we as we walk up uh, to uh, to the election for us to understand what does it mean for us to care for each other right now, especially those who are the most vulnerable with what's happening in America at this point. All right. Well, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do uh, before we close with some time of uh, communion and one last song together. If you are new or newer with us as you're Zooming or Facebooking in, uh, we are gonna drop a link in the chat for you to follow fill out a connect card online. Uh, it just lets you uh, let us know your uh, contact information and uh, how you heard about us. And we follow up with every uh, card we receive just so we can kind of get to know you. We love to do, we're doing lots of virtual coffees these days or uh, while the weather still maintains some social distanced coffees or if you're uh, zooming in from afar, uh, we can e easily get together on Zoom and, and, and share a mug and get to know you. If you've been checking us out, if you've been like hanging around on our Zoom calls and I haven't yet gotten to meet with you personally, I would love to do that just to throw that out there. So follow that link and let us know and I'll follow up with you. I would love to connect and get to know why this space is, is helping you. Um, if you are a regular here and you want to let us know about a prayer request or a need that you have, or you want to grab coffee with one of the pastors or pastoral care team, uh, just uh, uh, follow the Sunday check-in link that's uh, being dropped in there for you and let us know. It'll only take you less than a minute to do that. If you are in a time of need financially because of COVID, we also uh, are mentioning our uh, time of need fund request, uh, which you can fill out online. It's totally confidential. And we, uh, the church is in position with our neighboring budget, as you see up on the screen here, to help people. And we have helped a number of people already, as you're also seeing uh, so far. So we would be, we'd be very happy to be able to uh, offer assistance if we can. Finally, we are crowdfunded. And so we uh, wanna give a special thank you to everybody who donates. Uh, if, if you're uh, thinking about giving a, a one-time gift to show us some love, we're so grateful. If you're a stakeholder here, we, uh, we ask our stakeholders to consider uh, recurring gifts because they help keep us going in an ongoing way and they help us to plan and budget because we know what to expect. Uh, within the next five years, as you're looking at our financial update here on the screen, uh, we want to double our current monthly income so we can expand our ability to pastor uh, women and people of color by hiring uh, a woman and a person of color on our pastoral staff. So, uh, so you can see uh, how we're doing and sort of what we're shooting for here in our financial update. The best ways to stay connected right now are our community directory, which you can access on our website and find out contact information for anybody who's active in our community. The password for that is in our chat there. You can follow old services on YouTube or uh, you can get just the discussion or sermon portions on our podcast. You can follow our email newsletter or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If, uh, if you did not see, if you're a stakeholder and you did not see that a couple of weeks ago, we released a five-year vision for our church. We spent the entire month of September as a whole church having discussions, dreaming about the future together because COVID-19 changed all of our plans. And we really felt excited about what came out of those discussions. Uh, we released our five-year vision two weeks ago. It was sort of Kyle and, and myself reporting back to everybody what we've heard. And uh, if you haven't heard that yet, it is on YouTube and it is on our podcast. We'd love for you to go back and find that. And part of the five-year vision is that we're asking everybody to invest in a new way for us to connect online. And that is through an app called Discord. I knew nothing about Discord uh, about a month ago. And now I know a lot about Discord because I'm on it and Brownline Church is on it. And we'd love for you to be connected on it. So we're taking just a few minutes, each of our services here to do a quick little tutorial. And so uh, we've asked once again, one of our, our Discord gurus in uh, the community, Joel Martins, if he can uh, do another little screen share and show us uh, what we're looking at. Joel, are you there? I am here. Hi, everybody. Um, I need uh, screen share privileges. There we go. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. <I'm> so <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Joel. All right. So first, um, I want to show you how to get to Discord. Um, this is discord.com. So if you're on a PC or a Mac, or you can go to discord.com and you can click open discord in the top right here and open discord and it will open it up in a web browser or you can download it for your computer um, and it'll be a desktop application. So you'll notice I'll click right here, opening it, opening it up. Now, when you're in discord, um, this is kind of where all of our, um, Kind of online community will be taking place you can actually see um i'm actually already logged in here and um 
this is a channel here. And so I can join this channel. And I was streaming Zoom, uh, the Zoom um, video. So if somebody was here, they could actually come here and you can share your screen by clicking this button here or turn on your camera by clicking this button here. And these are voice channels. So you can see Kyle has popped in, popped in here. So we could uh, just have a voice conversation now if we wanted. And of course there are also all the text channels as well, um, which I was putting some comments on during the um, uh, presentation from Joey. Great job, Joey. Um, super, super happy with your talk today, by the way. So. A couple of other things. Um, there are we're constantly being bombarded in our modern day with um, everybody competing for our attention from advertisements to social media. And so it can be cumbersome to have another source of messages coming flooding in. So what you can do is you can actually um, control your messages from the discord. Um, so if you want to always have a mess a message every time or a ping on your phone, if you have the phone app. Um, you can do that. Alternatively, you can selectively mute channels uh, for different periods. So say you want to check it once a day, you can come in to the Brownland Vineyard Church, go to notification settings and um, set them. So you can say, I only want message. I want to get a notification when I get on when, the when there's any message on the server. I have it set to only when somebody at, at me, so they do at Joel, and then I'll get a notification for it. Um, or I never want to get a notification. So you only want to see the data, or the, the chats when you open it up. Um, so that's, that's um, and you can do that for the whole channel um, on the left here by selecting the server, or you can do it on any specific channel. So if you didn't, if you don't care about people's families, um, then you could, if you're that soulless and heartless, uh, then you could come speaking of family. You, oh, thank you, buddy. Hey, Seva, I'm on the phone, buddy. Come, come here. And so, uh, the, right. So yeah, you can, you can mute it for a duration. I like to, I check this a couple times a day. Um, so it's up to you on your rhythm and how you want to check it. Hey, Seva, can you stop, please? It's not, it's not working guys. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that's that's Discord. Um, feel free to join. Uh, I plan on joining and then streaming the Zoom here. So if you wanted, you could actually um, come and click the small group here and and have a conversation during the service as well. So please feel free to join me. Thank you. I like it. Thanks, Joel. Thank you so much. And we're learning slowly more about uh, Discord. If you have more questions, don't worry. We all have questions. And so you can keep posing those. I've helped a bunch of people get started with Discord and still there's more questions. So uh, we want to, uh, we do want to encourage you if this does feel like you actually already feel like you're a pretty well connected person and you're like, oh, I'm not sure I need something else. We are going to still encourage you. Would you consider investing in Discord for the sake of those who are not yet connected? And this can be a space that especially during COVID, all of us, even those of us in Chicago who are are connecting newly to the church or who don't have as many friends or as many uh, long time connections here. This is a way that people are building connections. And then especially for those who are joining us from beyond Chicago, this is the only way that they can interact with people. This they don't We don't actually have a space that we can share geographically. And so this is our space. This is like, hey, we're going to go and we're going to hang out in this room together, or we're going to find out what's going on in our lives because we're sharing in the channels. So we do want to strongly encourage you, if you're invested in this church, to try to get on Discord and find a rhythm for you that works by, you know, connecting with it as, as often as you like, uh, but staying engaged. All right. Thank you so much, Joel and, uh, and Kyle. Let me uh, pitch it to you uh, for communion. Yeah, we finish our service each week with a moment of communion. Um, it's a moment for us to both look to God uh, to help meet the needs we can't give ourselves and then look to each other and recognizing we don't do life alone. And as I think about that today, there is a, a question in the chat and a conversation that feels always so important to me, which is this idea of like, what if uh, what if you're considered the lost sheep in some conservative circle um, or this idea of people who um, are in this kind of religious evangelical majority in our country? Like, how do we how do we engage that conversation? And, and simply the way I've, I've tended to land is if somebody thinks I'm a lost sheep, they're not likely to listen to me. 
they're not likely to be swayed or moved or changed. And actually the ideology of conservatism in our country is actually scientifically shown that changing of perspectives and minds is something incredibly unlikely. And so I try to release myself from that. And in turn, what I try to do is what we're gonna do in communion here is recognize that I'm not a lost sheep, that in fact, I'm immensely loved and found by God. And God sees me and meets me. And the way that those kind of conversations can hollow out my heart, the way those conversations can throw a sense of emptiness in my stomach, God can fill me up and say that you are mine and I see you and no other person gets to name that for you. And so as we look to God, we look to this uh, moment of the him, uh, the night he was betrayed, where he talks about breaking the bread, um, symbolizing his body broken, pouring the wine, symbolizing his bloodshed at the moment of his deep, deep, deep sense of persecution, oppression, the sense of suffering that he went through of being deeply misunderstood and deeply uncared for to bring new life on Easter morning. And I think that's what he offers us here too, is that sense of if we feel the weight of people around us who exist in a culture of faith that call our own acceptance to God in doubt, that we don't get it from them, we get it from him, and that he offers new life and new hope, and that we have a community here around us of people who come from all sorts of different experiences and perceive things in all sorts of different ways, and that is a gift because we get to see a picture of God we would not if all of us were the same. And we get to all come around and in the name of Jesus, speak to each other as a community that you are seen and you are loved and that there is space here for you. And so as we do communion, that is what I have in mind. That you can find some kind of drink or some kind of food throughout history and throughout the world. They've used all sorts of food and drink for this. So whatever you have on hand is fine. I have coffee and an old goldfish. Um, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread, gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. He said, whenever you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And I do, Jesus. And in the way that Rebecca talked about this on National Coming Out Day, that sense of radical acceptance, that you see me, you know me, you are not ashamed of me. You are not thrown off by any parts of me. There's no questions I can ask. There's no statements I can say that would shock you. But you deeply see who I am and you love me that that's not something other people can extend to me. That's what you extend to me. I pray that we would feel that true today, that people all across our country who are coming out would feel that today. But each one of us would walk through this week with a deep sense of value and who we are, that nobody else can call us the lost ones because we know we're valuable and we know we are loved. And in a community here, I pray that we would see each other, each one of us, see ways to communicate that sense of value that you already have bestowed upon us and see this support around us of a life that we are not alone in, but we have a God who loves us and a community of people here that long to support us. Pray that in your name, Jesus. My God, my God, wherever I go, glory.
Lord, be with us. Be with us today. Be with us this week. May we, we see ourselves through your eyes. May we see each other through your eyes. May we find the hope of a resurrection that in death there is life. And I pray that this week we would feel you with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you again to Joey and to Allison and Lara and Rebecca and Kyle and even me for helping us out. And thank, oh, thank you also for Saba and Ginny for showing their cute faces. Um, we appreciate the chillins. Um, if you're sticking around for uh, the uh, breakout for uh, I'm Still Here book club, uh, just hang tight. And um, I, if you're, if you want to hang out in Discord, you can go do that. People are sort of here, so maybe you want to check on what Joel uh, commented on in there and add your words there. But otherwise, we'll see you soon. Can you say bye to Daddy. Daddy. Say bye, bye, Daddy. <laughs> nice job, Jenny. Bye, baby. Bye. Is that all? you're very shy right now? Daddy. Yeah, I'm here. I see you. I'm really sorry. I'm going to Oh. I'm going to Who's that? Who's that guy? Hi, Jenny. Who's that? Hi, Jenny. <laughs> hey, hi. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Yeah, nice to see you. 